copy of the Word of God with you this morning. I do invite you to turn to the book of Deuteronomy. We are in chapter 2 this morning, and we will commence to read the Word of God at verse 1. So please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2, and we shall commence to read together at the first verse, reading all the way through to verse 25. Let us hear together the Word of God. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, you have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land, no, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on, away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Arabah road, from Elath and Ezion Geber. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle. For I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. The Emim formerly lived there, and people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they were also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Emim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place." as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. Now rise up and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered, and the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years, until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp, as the Lord had swore to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, Today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the, the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession." It is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and He dispossessed them and settled in their place, as He did for the people of Esau who live in Seir when He destroyed the Horites before them, and He dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftarim, who came from Kaftar, destroyed them and settled in their place. Rise up, set out on your journey, and go over the valley of the Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite king of Heshbon and his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the people's who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you, and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Amen. So reads God's Word to us this morning. As we come to it, let us bow and let us seek God in prayer and ask His help. Let's pray together. Father, we have been reminded by the hymn writer that you are the great God who guides your people through life. Even as you guided your ancient people through the wilderness, you are the God who guides your people even now in this world. You are the sovereign God who does not change the great I am, 
the God who has no beginning and no end, the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. There is none like you. You are the incomparable God, the one who is worthy to be praised, worthy to be served. We come to you this morning, our Father, thankful that we have your holy word to teach us what we are to believe about you and what you require of us as your creatures. We pray now as we turn to your word that we would know the help of your Holy Spirit, that he would illuminate our understanding as we take up the Scriptures afresh this morning, that we would learn of you, our Father, that we would see something of the glory of Christ this morning even in your word, that you would fill us with your Spirit, that we would be a holy people. We would walk by faith and not by sight, seeking to bring honor and glory to your name. O oh, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come now, we pray. Minister your truth to us and change us by your grace. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. On October the 2nd, 1792, 12 pastors, a ministry student, and a deacon gathered together in the home of a widow in the English town of Kettering. The home of Widow Wallace was affectionately known as the Gospel Inn because of the many gospel ministers who would often enjoy hospitality there as they came through the town. On this particular occasion, October the 2nd, 1792, those meeting in the back parlor of the home of Widow Wallace were English particular Baptists. Their task was to discuss the plan of their Baptist association to take the gospel to the nations and so become part of the great movement of global missions that was stirring up the English church at the end of the 18th century. All of these men pastored small churches. Their church members were poor. They didn't have very much. They were largely uneducated. Even some of them were illiterate. They were nobodies from rural England with little to no means of influence. On that evening that went long into the night, these men, as they talked and prayed and discussed, raised the princely sum of 13 pounds, two shillings, and six pence, and resolved to start the particular Baptist society for the propagation of the gospel amongst the heathen. What could possibly motivate a small group of rural Christian men to such an endeavor? None of them were far traveled. None of them were experienced in missions. None of them were highly educated in global affairs. Yet here they were. The eldest of them was 40. The youngest of them was 26, deciding to engage in the greatest work in all the world, the work of gospel missions, and a work that would change their lives and the lives of countless millions forever. What motivated them? Well, I am persuaded that at the heart of their motivation was their understanding of God and His eternal purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the heart of their motivation was their trust in the God of all the nations, the sovereign God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and who rules and reigns over it all for the purpose of glorifying His Son 
Jesus Christ. The truth that our God is the God of all the nations is fundamental to our lives as Christians, to our faithfulness to Him. And it's something that each and every child of God must understand, must embrace if they would be faithful to God, and if they would participate in His great purpose on the earth. It's vital to every church that every church would understand this and embrace it and live out their life in the light of it. And this morning, as we return to our studies in Deuteronomy, to this opening section of the book that we are in, we are in this section of historical review that Moses lays out at the very beginning of his instruction to the Israelites as they are sitting upon the threshold of the land of Canaan, awaiting uh, going into the land to take possession of the land. Here in this historical section, Moses is preparing the people for conquest. He's preparing the people to renew their covenant commitment to their God and to take the land that has been promised to them through Abraham. In Deuteronomy 2 verse 1 all the way through to 3.29, Moses recalls the various interaction of the Israelites with the nations as they made their way through the wilderness towards Canaan. And this morning, in the time that we have, I want us to focus in on the first half of that, chapter 2, verses 1 through 25. You remember that having begun his address, Moses has reminded them of the importance of being an ordered people as they go into the land. He has warned them against the danger of unbelief that had brought about defeat in the previous generation. Now, as Moses moves into chapter 2, verses 1 through 23, he brings before them the truth that the God who has redeemed them, remember, he has redeemed them out of Egypt and brought them through the wilderness, has also promised them this land of Canaan, that that God is the God not only of Israel, but the God of all the nations the God, if you want to use New Testament language, of the whole world. He is the God who rules. He is the God who reigns over all the peoples of the earth, and He is the God who does what He pleases with the nations. And here, as Moses stands on the plains of Moab to give these final addresses of instruction to the Israelite people, he is reminding them of the greatness of their God, of the sovereignty of their God, that their God is the God of all the nations, that they must trust in Him, and that they must serve Him faithfully. And as we consider this portion of Deuteronomy this morning. I have three points that I want you to see. The examples of God's sovereignty that are cited, the excursus about God's sovereignty that must be considered, and then the exhortation from God's sovereignty that needs to be applied. The examples of God's sovereignty cited, the excursus about God's sovereignty considered, and then thirdly, the exhortations from God's sovereignty that needs to be applied. So, come with me and let us consider, first of all, the example of God's sovereignty Moses cites here for the Israelites. As Moses brings God's Word to the generation that is now before him, this is the generation that has come up, children in the wilderness, now adults, ready to take the land. He is well aware that his time is coming to an end. He's well aware that his time is coming to a close. He's not going into the land with the people. That means he knows his death is coming. And these are his final addresses, his final exhortations. He's led the nation now for 40 years, and he is recalling the past. He is bringing three nations in particular to the attention of the people by way of example of God's sovereignty 
three nations that would have been fresh in the minds of all those who were listening to him as they had lived through these things, albeit younger, but nevertheless in reality. Notice chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. The first nation that God recalls through Moses to the Israelites is the nation of Edom, the descendants of Esau. You'll notice in the text that it refers to them as their brothers, verse 4. Remember that the Israelites were well aware of their history, not like some of us, right? The Israelites recognized the importance of history and of remembering their past and of understanding their past. They were well aware that Jacob became Israel, but they're also well aware that Jacob had a brother whose name was Esau. And the whole history of that is recorded, of course, in the book of Genesis for us. The, the Edomites, as they're called, the descendants of Esau, they were relatives of the Israelites. And God speaks of them being settled in land that God had already given to them. And as we think about these Edomites, I want you to see that Moses recalls three matters uh, to the Israelites as he speaks to them. He speaks, first of all, regarding the Edomites, uh, a word of caution. Notice verse 4. Turn northward and command the people you're about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. They will be afraid of you. Why would they be afraid of the Israelites? Well, the Israelites were almost two million in number. That's a lot of people to come up the street. It's a lot of people to wander across your land. They also would have been aware, undoubtedly, of some of the great miraculous events that had brought Israel out of Egypt. Land, uh, news travels fast across the short land of the Middle East. The trade routes between Egypt and the Middle East would have been uh, easy for people to move around in, and there would have been stories coming back and forward of, of plagues and of deliverance and of, of, of events that were bringing out this great multitude the people of Yahweh were coming to Edom. And there was a history. Jacob and Esau hadn't done too well together. There would have been fears. There would have been all manner of suspicions. God warns Israel, be aware. They'll be afraid of you. And if someone's afraid of you, they will react in a particular way if you're not careful. You need to recognize that. So just be cautious, recognize they're fearful of you as you're marching through. Then he gives a word of instruction, verse 5. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. Don't start any fighting to try and take land from them. That's not your inheritance, Israel. It's not your inheritance. I've given them land. I've given you land too, but it's not theirs. There's a word of instruction given to Israel that they would not enter into conflict to try and take land that God had not given to them. And then there's a word of reminder, verses 6 through 8. Israel is reminded of God's provision for them, whether supernaturally, as they'd experienced by the manna and the quail, or whether naturally, by ordinary economic trading, God was with Israel. And God would continue to provide for Israel because God was taking Israel to Canaan. Here is an example that Moses cites for Israel to consider afresh of his sovereignty. His sovereignty over the nations. Not just the nation of Israel, but the nation of Edom. And then verses 9 through 15, we have the second nation that Moses speaks of, the nation of Moab. Moab was the descendant of Lot, Abraham's nephew. Again, relatives of the Israelites. And again, a word of caution is given. Verse 9 in our text, it tells us, and the Lord said to me, do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession. Israel is moving 
in the direction of God's guiding and being given direction through Moses of how to conduct themselves. The descendants of Lot, like Edom, had been given their land that was not part of the inheritance of the Israelites, and they were not to try to take it off them. We then come to verses 10 through 12, and we'll consider this in the second main point this morning. That's part of the excursus. So we want to jump down to verse 13. And having recalled the land of Edom and the land of Moab, Moses reminds the people of the time that it had taken for them to get through the wilderness. Look at verse 13. Now rise and go up and over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered and the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. It should have taken 11 days. It took them a generation. Why? They had not trusted the Lord. They had not obeyed the Lord. So they suffered because of their unbelief. They suffered because they did not do what God had commanded them. And so, what do we find here? We find here in this text that part of the reasoning for them wandering for the, 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 the 38 years is so that the unbelieving generation, notice this, the entire generation would die and never make it to Canaan. We have to be careful, don't we, when we think about this. It's quite sobering, I think. Moses is talking to the children of this generation. He's talking to them about their parents. He's talking to them about the generation just before them. And he's saying to them, uh, one of the reasons why you've wandered for all these years is because of the unbelief of your parents, and so that God could actually bring to an end their lives before you would enter the land. Unbelief, as we saw last time, it's a serious matter with God. We tend to downplay it, we tend to poo-poo it, but with God it's a serious matter. It brings all manner of hardship, all manner of suffering, all manner of difficulty into our lives when we do not trust the Lord. And so here we see God making it clear that He had determined to kill off the entire generation Um, Moses had led out of Egypt as adults because of their unbelief. They would not inherit the land because of their rebellion against the Lord. But observe, once that generation had died, verses 16 through 18, the Lord led Israel back across the border towards the third nation, verse 19, the nation of Ammon. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. A word of caution again. You notice that? Israel must not harass Ammon, just like they must not harass Edom. And they must not harass Moab. Why? Because the land that had been given to the Ammonites, just as the land that had been given to Edom and to, to Moab, was the land God had given to them. God had ordained for them. And as the new generation of Israelites sit overlooking the land of Canaan on the plains of Moab, and they're listening to Moses recalling their dealings with Edom and Moab and Ammon, what is it Moses is driving home to them by these examples. Your God, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, your God is not only the God of Israel, He's the God of all the nations. He's the God of all the nations. The whole world is the Lord's. The Lord. Yahweh is king over all the nations and ordains the boundaries of their habitation. Something Paul picks up in the book of Acts centuries later. The Lord is king over all the nations and He ordains the boundaries of their habitation. What a vital truth this was for Israel to learn. What a vital truth this is, brothers and sisters, for us to learn this morning. The Lord omnipotent reigns over all the nations. He raises one up. He brings another one down. The boundaries of every single people group in the world 
is ultimately determined not by men, but by God. Notwithstanding the efforts of men, notwithstanding the opinions of men, it is God who reigns supreme. This is a great truth that should encourage us this morning and give us confidence in our God this morning. In a day when man thinks he controls his own destiny and nations think they are self-determining, we are reminded from our Bibles we are reminded by God through His servant Moses that God is in control, that God is Lord over all the nations. God gives them land, and God takes it away. God settles peoples in land, and God decides when to unsettle them. He decrees whatsoever comes to pass. Something Israel needed to be reminded of, be encouraged about as they anticipated what was before them in conquering Canaan. Something we as the church in our day need to be reminded of in a day when there are so many shifting sands and we, we can become perturbed and concerned. The Lord is in control. When you go to your bed at night, do you remind yourself of that? Or do you lie awake until three o'clock in the morning worrying about whether or not this, that, or the next thing is going to happen? Now, don't worry. I've had those nights too. But it is a reassuring thing, isn't it, to remind your heart afresh. The Lord omnipotent reigns. He will perfect that which He has decreed. We can rest in our God. He is the sovereign God of all the nations. Always has been, always will be. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, how important it is to see this, to understand this. We look at Edom, we look at Moab, we look at Ammon, and we see God saying to Israel, I'm in control of all the nations, not just you, but all the nations. That brings us to our second consideration, the excursus about God's sovereignty that needs to be considered and that Moses gives here. When I talk about excursus, I mean those two sections in our passage this morning that kind of interrupt the flow of what Moses has been saying about these nations that God has given land to. And there are two excursus here in our passage that we need to consider. First of all, verses 10 through 12. The first excursus is in verses 10 through 12. Just after the recollection about Moses about Moab, Moses gives his first excursus. And in it, he speaks here uh, of those who possessed the land of Moab before the Moabites. God loves history. Did you know that? So should you, right? It's amazing. He speaks of the Emim, of legendary status like the Anakim. You'd be glad you were not reading the Scriptures publicly this morning. The great warriors of old, they were also known as the Rephaim. You know where all these modern sci-fi movies try to get all their names from? It's funny, isn't it? They all sound like Bible names. You know, Luke Skywalker and the whatever. And you think, ah, somebody's been reading the Old Testament. Right? Because God had these nations long before men invented them for the movies. He speaks of the Horites dispossessed by descendants of Esau to give Edom its land. So here are the Moabites, and they dispossessed uh, the, the Rephaim, and here are the Edomites, and, and they dispossessed the, the Horites. Uh, we have this peculiar little phrase then tucked in in verse 12. Did you notice it as we were going through? Can't skip it. Got to see it. As Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. That's a little editorial note. I believe added by the final collator of the book of Deuteronomy when he gathered all the, uh, the sayings of Moses together. He slips this in for future generations uh, to, to remind us of why God is actually telling us all this. You ever wonder? You read something, why have we got all the history of this? What's the point of learning about the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites? And you can be tempted, oh, I just want John's gospel. Ah, but you see, you'll be missing so much of what God wants you to know about Him, about what God wants you to see about Him. 
And by speaking of the dispossession of the Emim and the Horites, Moses' intention was to clearly encourage Israel to realize that just as God has dispossessed these other nations to give Moab and Edom their land, He's going to dispossess the Canaanites to give you the land as you march in and obey the Lord. It was an encouragement. Moses recalling their history. It was an encouragement. Moses telling them about the sovereignty of God over the nations to stir up their faith, to trust in their God. By speaking of the dispossession of the Emim and the Horites, Moses' intention was to stir up the hearts of God's people to trust Him for His promises that they would obey Him and take the land. Something that their forefathers had failed to do. Something that their parents had fallen short in. They needed to trust Him that they were going to see Canaan dispossessed just like Moab saw the Rephaim dispossessed, just like Edom saw the Horites dispossessed. Israel were to see the Canaanites dispossessed. And so this second, this first excursus is to remind us that dispossession had taken place for these nations to possess their land, and it would have to take place for Israel to possess its land. And then there's a second excursus that further drives this home. Uh, chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. It is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites call them, and I love this one, Zamzumim. Only a Scotsman can really say that. <laughs> a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites. So, we found out that the Edomites and the Moabites, they dispossessed other peoples, and the Ammonites, they did it too. Moses is reminding Israel again that it's going to take the dispossession of one people group for them to take the land as the people of God. And they needed to trust God, the God of the nations, the God who has done it for Edom, and for Moab, and for Ammon. He's going to do it for Israel, because He's not only the God of Israel, but He's the God of all the nations. And as we read this, and as we think upon this, we see very clearly the sovereignty of God over all things, the sovereignty of God over all nations. God's covenant nation has taken 40 long years to get to the border of Canaan. They have failed already to enter the land and to possess it. Remember? The spies went up to spy the land, and oh, 10 of them, no. Two of them, yes. Two of them are still alive. Caleb and Joshua, they'll go into the land. The others are gone. They didn't believe that God could do what God said He would do. Joshua and Caleb did. The God of all the nations dispossesses to give possession. This is the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. This is the Lord of glory that we have to understand. This is the God with whom we have to do. What better way for Moses to encourage the people as they're looking over the plains of Moab and they can see the land of Canaan and they know there's a great fortified city like Jericho and many others uh, to be taken. What better way for him to encourage them than to remind them, your God is the God of all the nations and He dispossesses to give possession. Trust Him. What He has done with other nations, He'll do for you. You see, the Lord is king over all the nations, and He chooses who wins and who loses. He chooses who wins and who loses. Now, I realize that to say something like that in the 21st century is a most controversial statement. Indeed, for some of our modern neighbors, it would give them a meltdown. With all the calls we have today about all the way people are looking at history, 
and all the way they want to revise it and reinterpret it. Listen, here it is in all its naked truth. God is Lord of all the nations, and God dispossesses one to give possession to another according to his purpose and for his glory. And there is nothing men can do about it. Oh, men try. Men reject this notion. Men will not have this notion. Now, listen, we're not saying that every single event in the history of the world where one nation dispossesses another nation means that the nation that did the stealing of the land has done the right thing. We're not saying that. We're not exonerating any evil conduct of any people group over another people group with regards to what honors God. We're not saying that at all. Man is responsible for his conduct. But ultimately, God decides who wins and who loses. God decides that. Edom dispossessed the Horites. I don't know who was there before the Horites. God hasn't told us, but somebody probably was. Moab dispossessed the Rephaim. I don't know who was there before the Rephaim, but probably somebody was there. Ammon dispossessed the same, but it was all because God determined it would be that way. And just as the Canaanites were settled in their land, God had determined it would be given to Israel and taken away from them. You see, when you do not understand who God is and who's in control of the world and what God is doing, then all you've got left is your own efforts at interpreting providence. Now, we have to be careful. None of us are infallible interpreters of providence. And all of us have our prejudices, and all of us have our biases. But it is a fundamental truth that we must believe when we approach even the subject of history, which is simply the story of providence, that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, and it belongs to Him. And every kindred and tongue and people and nation belong to God to do with as He chooses, irrespective of what men might think. He determines who gets what and when. And he lived, who lives where and when? And who's on top and who is not and when? This doesn't mean that men are excused for their wickedness. We must never do that. We must be committed to righteousness. But nevertheless, the truth stands. God chooses the winners and the losers. The history of the world and the history of nations shows this. If we have the eye of faith to believe it right up to the present day, right up to this very moment. The migrations of all peoples is in the hand of God. I remember a few years ago watching the BBC, which I do fairly regularly to get more better news than you get in America. I've done it for 17 years, and I've got no interest in changing that. In fact, I'm even more convinced than ever. You should watch the BBC. It would help you. Don't believe everything, but it's better than your average American source. But I remember watching a video on the BBC of the migration of men, mainly men, coming from the Middle East up through Hungary and Austria to the border. I'd never seen anything like it really since maybe film I've seen of the Second World War. The migration of a people group or a section of that people group, to the heart of Europe. And, and people, were, people were staggered and shocked and terrified, and all manner of comments were being made. But I remember sitting thinking to myself, what is God doing? This is fascinating. This is fascinating. Why did I say that? Because I believe God is in charge of all the people groups of the world. God is ruling over all the nations. One of my favorite 20th century preachers is Dr. Mike Lloyd-Jones. Now, it is interesting. The first time I ever listened to a Lloyd-Jones sermon on a cassette, yeah, that's how old I am, a cassette, which is you put in a machine. You don't put it to your ear. You put it in a machine. I remember falling asleep. I think it was partly because I was at seminary and I was up late and I was, I was tired. But I remember thinking to myself, well, that was very ordinary. Ordinary. 
But then the more I listened to Lloyd-Jones, the more I studied his sermons, the more I began to realize God had him in a particular place at a particular time for a particular purpose. You maybe don't know the story of Lloyd-Jones, but he bought his house in London the day that the Germans invaded Poland. If you don't know when that is, it's September 1939. So he just moved to his new pastorate in London, which in the next couple of years was going to get bombed at least for 40 nights in a row. He was a pastor of a large church right there at Westminster. Lloyd-Jones' congregation dropped from a couple of thousand to a couple of hundred during those early war years. But as, as the war began to turn and as Europe began to, uh, or, or as the Allies began to gain uh, ascendancy, Britain, London, became a center for what? All the armed forces of the Allies from New Zealand to Australia, to South Africa, to Canada, to India, coming through London, getting ready for Normandy. And there was a preacher, not the only preacher, but a significant preacher called Lloyd-Jones preaching at Westminster, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that ministry had a profound effect on what is called the British Commonwealth. To such a point that the gospel of Christ, as it was preached, and all those servicemen and women who came through at that critical time in history, heard that gospel. They went back to their lands, either new Christians or stronger Christians, to do the work of the gospel. God doesn't need the internet. He's using the internet, but doesn't need it. He can just ordain a world war for the furtherance of the gospel. Do you have the eyes to see this? Do you believe in a sovereign God, a God over all the nations? Have you ever considered the issues of the Middle East and the Muslim world from the perspective of the kingdom of God? One particular perspective I think is worth considering is this. One of the reasons why so many of the Muslim peoples are coming to us is because we have not gone to them with the gospel. And so God has decided, I'm going to bring them to the churches because the churches are sitting on their hands. Now, that's one possible interpretation. I won't say it's an infallible one, but have you ever considered that? Have you ever wondered why it is there are more Jews living in North America than ever could fit into Israel? Could it be because we're meant to reach them with the gospel? It's a lot easier to reach them in America than it is to reach them in modern Israel. Have you ever considered an article I read about three weeks ago, I thought was very interesting, that in 20 years from now, 2040, if God continues to work as He is in China, China could be the largest Christian country in the world. And the Chinese Communist Party will have to reckon with upwards of 300 million Christians in their country. There was a great British politician, one of the great Britons of British history. His name was Winston Churchill. And he talked about the, com the coming of an iron curtain falling down over Eastern Europe. When I was in my late teens, I would attend prayer meetings in my church, and we would pray that God would bring down the iron curtain. That was the kind of praying we used to do. We would pray that the gospel that was being preached from a radio station in northern Italy would reach Albania, where the president had said God was dead. And in 1989, the wall began to crumble, and the iron curtain fell down, and the gospel began to have an even greater impact. I have a friend who's been in Albania now for over 14 years as a missionary, planting churches, serving Christ. God answers prayer because He's the God of the nations, sovereign over all. Borders, boundaries to Him are no hindrance. My dear brothers and sisters, listen. I had the joy of being involved in church planting for over seven years back and forward to Germany, learned a lot about how not to plant a church in another culture rather than how to plant one. But there was a man there 
who I had the opportunity a number of times to have dinner with him and his family. He was a former Muslim. He had been in a refugee camp in southern Lebanon in the 1980s. If you know anything about the Middle East history in the 1980s, there was great conflict between Lebanon, South Lebanon, and uh, Israel, and Hezbollah, and, uh, and the Druze militias, and all of that. He was in a refugee camp with his wife and his children. And one particular day, the militia backed by the Israelis came into that camp and massacred everybody. He was shot. His wife and children were killed. He was airlifted to Germany. He showed me his bullet marks. He had a number of bullet marks. I've never forgotten that, where he had been shot. He was airlifted to Germany. He was a Muslim. He was airlifted to Germany. He was taken to a hospital in Germany where a, a German nurse began to nurse him back to health. In the process of nursing him back to health, she gave him the gospel. In the process of nursing him back to health, he heard the gospel through this nurse and believed in Jesus. In the process, they fell in love. And they got married. And they had children. I've met the whole family. He can still tell the story of seeing his wife and children lying in pools of blood in the refugee camp. What a horrendous experience. But his conviction was that God, in his sovereignty, in the mystery of his sovereignty, had brought that experience into his life to lift him out of South Lebanon, to bring him to Germany, to hear the gospel, to become a Christian. It's not the end of the story. He had brothers who did not appreciate him coming to faith in Christ, and they came to Germany to try and kill him. And for a while, he had to be in hiding. That's past now. It's a long time ago in his back background. But what we need to realize is that the God with whom we have to deal is the sovereign God of heaven and earth, the God of all the nations, the Lord over all. He chooses who wins and who loses, but it's all for his purpose in Christ. Israel is learning that Yahweh's purpose to dispossess and give possession to is all part of His purpose for them and for His glory. They have to believe it. They have to be persuaded of it so they can act accordingly. And that brings us to our last point, the exhortation from God's sovereignty that Moses presses here as he brings this recollection of God's dealings with them. Verse 24 and 25, rise up, set out on your journey, and go over the valley of the Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite king of Heshbon. We'll see him next time. And his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Reminded of who is in control, reminded of his power to give and take away, Israel exhorts Moses, uh, Moses exhorts Israel now, rise up and take the land. And Israel is encouraged by the reminder that God will be with them and God will bless them as they go. What a critical encouragement this is to Israel at this time. Forty years of wandering is now coming to an end. Moses, reminding them of their failures, is encouraging them now to succeed for the glory of God. He reminds them of the exhortation that was given back then to rise up and go forward. This generation is going to rise up and take the land. Because God is in their midst, and God has called them, and God is sending them into Canaan. And my dear brothers and sisters, as we think upon God's sovereignty over the nations this morning, what is the exhortation to us? Take courage and be bold to serve the Lord. Take courage and be bold to serve the Lord. Make sure this is the lens 
that you have on your eyes, that informs your mind, that shapes your affections, that governs your will in your life. God is sovereign over the nations, and there's nothing can stop His purpose in Jesus Christ. The implications of this for us are obvious. In a day of global pandemic, in a day of global tensions, global fears, we need to remind ourselves of who is in control. What can China do that God is not orchestrating? What can America do that God is not orchestrating? What can Russia do that God is not orchestrating? Don't watch the news without your sovereign God glasses on. Put those lenses over your eyes and inform your mind and govern your affections and drive your will with a confident assurance that God of Israel is our God, the God of all the nations. And he's working out his purposes in his son. Even the events of Israel taking Canaan were all part of the bigger picture of God stepping into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. Moses knew it. Some of the Israelites got it. We see it all because of the glory of the gospel in our lives. What is the purpose of God amongst the nations? It is to call out a people to himself through the gospel. The church is at the center of the purpose of God among the nations. And we must not lose sight of that, dear brothers and sisters. We must increase our conviction about this. We must be sure and certain about this. With all the noise in America and around the world, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord and upon His Word. And we need to be governed by His truth, trusting in Him, knowing who He is, knowing what He is about, and seeking then to order our lives in such a way as to reflect the fact that we actually believe this. I want to ask you as we close, is your doctrine of the sovereignty of God too small? Is your confidence in the gospel lacking? Or are you persuaded that the God of Israel is your God this morning through Jesus Christ? You might not be a Christian here this morning. You might wonder about the practical implications of Christianity and whether it makes sense in the big uh, wide world in which you live. Let me make it very clear to you. You cannot make sense of human history apart from God and Jesus Christ. There is no making sense of it apart from God Himself and His Son, the Lord Jesus. Christ stands at the center of human history. We read something of it in Revelation 20 this morning. Israel took possession of the land of Canaan, not as an end in itself, but as something part of a bigger plan and purpose of God to come into the world in Jesus Christ to bring about the accomplishment of salvation. Christ's life and death and resurrection are at the very center of all of human history, securing salvation and bringing us hope, not only for the Jew, who he came to first, but the Gentile, us, the world, all the nations. God's whole purpose for creating the world was to show forth his glory in the person of his Son and to save out of the old rebellious humanity of Adam and Eve a new humanity in Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. This is what the world is all about. This is what God is doing in the world. Now, I know that there are many people who would mock and scoff and laugh at that, and they reject that. That's unbelief. <laughs> That's what we are by nature. But God reveals it to us in His Word, and we are called to believe it and live our lives in the light of it. And so, ultimately, this is what the world is all about. This is what the rising and falling of the nations is all about. It exhorts us, God exhorts us in His Word to see it, to play our part in it. By doing what? By taking the gospel to the nations. Where the nations are. Now, for some of us, that means right here in our city. I know that that's the case. Why? Because we live in one of the most diverse cities in America. It's, it's wonderful. The nations are here. 
right? Spanish-speaking folks, Chinese-speaking folks, Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, all manner of languages in our city, all manner of communities in our city. Some of us may never have to go anywhere except just across the street, down the road to the coffee shop, engaging in the park, getting to know someone from a different people group than ourselves and telling them about Jesus. Yes, you can be a missionary right here in Sacramento, and you've no idea what that might do in the purpose of God to the nations. And then, of course, we have the other aspect of it, to actually go to the world. And there's an exciting opportunity for us this year, as Kyle and Hannah, we trust by the grace of God, will be our first going members to take the gospel, to impact the nations. You might think to yourself, well, it's only two people. Ha, huh. that's true. But God is able to take one person and change a nation. Now, Kyle and Hannah do not have such an inflated idea that they're going to be legends, but they want to be faithful. They're heeding the serious call of the Word of God to lay down their life. And we were going to be behind them, just as Andrew Fuller promised Carey. We're going to hold the ropes while they go down into the mine. And that means that we in Sacramento, in Emmanuel Baptist Church, we're not only involved in reaching the nations here, but we're going to be involved in reaching the nations there. And brothers and sisters, this is the mindset we need to have as the people of God. William Carey was 31 years old when he met in the Gospel Inn of Widow Wallace's house. He was one of the pastors who began the global mission effort amongst particular Baptists. Within a few short years of that meeting on that evening, he would be bound for India to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the perishing millions of that nation. Part of the process that led to Kerry going to India was a sermon that he preached on Wednesday the 13th of May. Uh, sorry, the 31st of May at the Nottingham Association meetings. His text was Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. And from it, Carey challenged the church of his day to rise and go into all the world with the gospel, with those famous words, expect great things from God, attempt great things from, for God. Now, whilst there is historical debate as whether he said it exactly that way or not, the point he was making is surely there in the sermon. If our God is the God of the nations, which he is, and he is sovereign over them all, which he is, and his purpose centrally is upon Christ and the gospel and the church, which it is, then surely we who are part of this great purpose of God should seek to live all of our lives as those who really believe it and who are completely persuaded by it so that we might see our God accomplish His purpose for His glory in even our short lives. May God help us this morning, brothers and sisters, to see who our God is, to love Him, and to want to bring honor and glory to Him. Let's pray together. Father, we're humbled when we come to portions of Your Word like this that expose us afresh to your sovereignty, to your power, to your greatness, to your majesty and glory. Father, we know that you are the God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. We also know that you are the God who has a great and glorious eternal purpose that you are working out through Jesus Christ, your Son. We're amazed that we have a part in this, Father. We could have so easily still been in our sins, blind, deaf, dead toward you, having no interest in you, no interest in your gospel, living for ourselves. But we bless you for your grace that called us from our unbelief to trust in you. Thank you for your word that reveals who you are, reveals what you are like, calls us to trust you, to serve you. Father, we pray today that we would be a church that is characterized by an understanding of who you are and your sovereignty over all the nations. And that even as nations rise and nations fall, and even as the sands of time continue to shift, our confidence 
our trust would be in you. We would be wholeheartedly committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to making him known amongst the nations, whether it be here at home or to the ends of the earth. Father, enlarge our hearts, enlarge our understanding, enlarge our commitment. In a day when many are fearful and many are in unbelief, strengthen our faith in you. Lead us forward, O God, to live for your glory, that we might honor your Son. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.